trainings, et cetera. Okay, so I'm really delighted uh, today to have Scott Kahn with us to talk to us about GDPR. Uh, just a tiny bit of background before he starts, and that is, so why would an organization like Genetic Alliance want to address this issue? And for us, it's been really important uh, issue, one that we've embraced even before the, the guidances and laws, et cetera, have begun to emerge from the various countries around security and privacy. We, um, Genetic Alliance uh, is the organization that had the very first lay led registry. And in fact, I had many a meeting uh, 25, 26 years ago where tomatoes were thrown at me and one meeting where I was evicted from advocacy meetings because I was suggesting that we should take the driver's seat and actually begin to control the data and open registries ourselves. Um, that's a, a great history that someday I'll have time to write, but meanwhile, I wanna forge forward so that we all get uh, the ac access to the data we need. And at the same time, give the people that we dearly love and serve the um, the, the, the kind of safety and, and uh, security, et cetera, that they need. So today we will be focusing on privacy. And while um, there's lots of issues around that, it's a complex one. So we have the pleasure of having Scott Kahn with us who will boil this down for us. Um, Scott is the former Chief Information Officer and VP of Commercial uh, Enterprise Informatics at Illumina and serves on the board of Rady Children's Hospital for Genomic Medicine, so has had his, uh, his uh, background in a very intense and um, uh, big way in technology, but also has the human and people side of things by serving on the Rady uh, Board of Directors. He's uh, at Luna DNA now um, with the team there working on all the data privacy and security pr provisions that comply with GDPR, HIPAA, and other things, CCPA in the US, et cetera. And he'll tell you all about that. Um, I should say that while Genetic Alliance struggled to make the registries uh, the way we wanted them to be, so that, for example, they were very useful for research, but also uh, were empowering people to be the controllers of their own data, um, we uh, we embraced and, and were excited to partner with with Luna in 2019 to take over all of our technology needs and to actually take on these thorny issues for us so that we didn't have to keep up with them because I, as I think you'll hear from Scott, um, this is a, a complicated uh, place. So last thing I'll say before I'll turn this over to Scott is if you just came in, um, if you could put your affiliation after your name, that would be great because we're not gonna do uh, introductions and that'll help Scott know who's here. Scott, all yours. Wonderful, and uh, thank thank you, Sharon, and everyone for gathering together. Uh, uh, what you didn't share is that Sharon and I have known each other, I would say forever, although I still didn't have any hair back then either. But um, it's been great to work with her, and and uh, I guess more recently, just being able to work very closely with Genetic Alliance has been eye opening in terms of some of the impacts that looking at privacy and how it can empower things. Uh, it, it's really been helpful to, ha to have the kind of the real world, the real world data to uh, to do that. Um, my goal today is to go through is to hopefully give you a, a primer of what's going on in the privacy world and to try to connect it to what um, is starting to happen in the health research world. Um, and I I tried to pick the a title for this that was uh, that would be interesting to everyone. And let me just go through my struggles of sharing my screen. And uh, I'm gonna, let's do this. So give me a second. And can you confirm Sharon, everything's coming through fine. Yep. It's the it's the slide presentation. It's not some wacky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's good. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks. Um, so, what I want to do is to really is to go through um, specifically the general data protection regulation that is implemented in the EU. But I'm hope, hopeful that I can connect it to all the other things that are going on. It's around the world, but I, I'd say very interestingly in the United States that people may not be so aware of it. And again, it's mo mostly to give you a sense of 
where the puck is going, not where the puck has been. Um, and the reason why I, I pose the question, is it an impediment or is it an enabler? I think you're very hard pressed to find people that would, that would um, make the case that data privacy is enabler is an enabler. I think everyone sees it as a huge, huge impediment. And I'll give, I'll give some evidence to that. I just think that it's, a, it's the right time to reconsider and to really peel apart what is meant by data privacy and the kinds of things that it offers that frankly are just not available in the, the old way of working and handling data. So if I'm unsuccessful at the end, I'm sure that you will uh, you'll share that opinion with me. I'm very open to, to any of those discussions. So I think a reasonable place to start is to just state that you know data privacy is, is nothing new. It's something that's been around for a long time and you know laws have been enacted to try to ensure that people's privacy can be protected. Uh, I think everyone's most aware of HIPAA, um, but I think, the alphabet soup of what's been going on around the world, um, more than just GDPR, I think, is something that isn't as, as front and center, but it's something that's quite relevant to the discussion. I, I, and by the way, this is not an exhaustive set. I merely tried to give you a, a sense of it's been going on all over. And the fact that the, you know, things like safe harbor and, and privacy shield have been invalidated as, the, as allowing data to be shared between countries, I think are quite relevant because the last thing that researchers want to have to deal with is the fact that data has to be uh, almost cloistered away in a separate place and just finding ways to do the research that is inclusive of individuals, not exclusive of individuals. The other thing that I've noted, and I've, I've tried to do this throughout the, the presentation, which I will share, and I will um, make a PDF of this presentation because a lot of the links, I, I've tried to put um, interesting additional reading in uh, throughout the presentation as links. So you, sh you should be able to just go and, and kind of get, get enriched by those as well. The thing that I noted is if we, people have been uh, Kind of following what's going on at the AMA, they they put out a set of privacy principles, and and what is interesting to me is that they the the they almost mirror the kinds of things in GDPR one to one, you know the rights of people and what what sorts of things should happen. These are clearly not laws; they're not regulations. But I think it it's it, it's indicating that you know people are people in the U.S are focused on where things need to go, not necessarily where things have been. Um, you could say, what, what's all the, you know, what's all the commotion about data privacy? Um, obviously what went on with Cambridge Analytica was relevant, but over and above that, there were, there's been a host of data breaches that are affecting people, um, whether it's with your credit report and all the, I mean, it's it's like almost on a on a monthly basis there is a significant data breach, and so the realization that the data that's being captured and stored by by companies and institutions can cause harm potentially to the people uh, about whom uh, it's describing. So we need to make sure that that we do a better job. We humankind do a better job. I'd say in, in the health world, obviously, it's been a longstanding thing that we need to do a good job. We need to be ethical. We need to ensure that we're doing the right thing. And, and there are IRBs and there are ERBs that, that, do, that serve that function. And yet, I'd say there's still a history of things that, that have happened. Some of the first three, you know, Tuskegee, the Gila, and, and the Havasupaya Indians, I call those sins of the father. They were, you know, all be before all of our time. I'm old, but I'm not that old. Uh, so these are things that have happened in history. But what, you know, what is interesting for me is that you can go into more recent 
uh, literature and find things that you just say to yourself, is this really what people had intended when they contributed their data to a, a database that was set to improve um, medical research? Like I said, I, I always say sexual orientation is not a medical condition to me, so it, it, it's just it's out of bounds. It shouldn't have been done. And the, uh, the use of the UK Biobank to look at, basically to look at incest was, again, a, a different use of data that was contributed for a purpose that was, that was not including that. So these are things that, to me, that just say that this issue of doing the right thing with the data, even though we've put in place the right kinds of institutions and controls, still can suffer from uses of data that aren't exactly aligned with uh, what people have been told. I'd say that, you know, with regard to medical research, as in Europe, the GDPR was adopted. So it was adopted in 2018. A lot of industry and, and uh, governmental associations have, have taken a bit of a pause to figure out what does this mean? So FPA is obviously really focused on the pharma industry, EMA, I'd say focused more broadly on, on um, medicines research. And you know, both of them are really working through, this is now three years later from when it was implemented, you know, what does it mean to be able to collect data on people uh, for, for medical research? What is the, or can secondary use of data happen? just trying to understand that in the context of the regulation. The two links that I put down there are um, really nice reading to help you um, kind of see the, the depth that this has been discussed. So there's, I think, a lot of scholarly work that's already been done here. For me, it, it, it just allows it, it time to ask the question, the world that is basically an institutional control world is it time to re to re-examine that like is there is there motivation at this point in time to say you know is this really the way that things have to work it's the way it's worked for whatever hundreds of years but is it really the way things have to work and the reason why i think that <clears throat> taking advantage of the of the forward-looking nature of what's going on in europe is relevant to the U.S. is things are happening in the U.S., uh, depending on what state you live in, you're more aware of it or less aware of it, that are, you know, giving rise to the fact that the regulations that we have to protect people um, with regard to their data privacy are evolving and states are not, you know, states realize they have to do a better job. So, you know, all the work that was put into, thank you, Sharon, for getting GINA passed and the the bits that had to be deleted so you get enough votes to get it through the Congress, um, they're being addressed by, by many states. But this whole notion of, you know, what's going on with more personal control of data, more information on how their data is being used, how long it's going to be stored, is coming uh, around in California, for me, front and center. Um, they passed uh, last year a, a measure that's going to be enacted in, in 2023 that is basically GDPR. So basically, individuals that live in California are going to have to be treated with regard to their privacy very similarly to the way they would be treated if they were a European citizen. And I'd say more of a nightmare is the fact that, you know, every state's going to do it a little bit differently. That's the nature of states. And, you know, how do you work in a patchwork of privacy regulation? Not rhetorical. The answer is just take the highest standard of privacy protection, give it to everybody. And then when the federal government catches up, that's great. Um, you know, you basically just take the high road. And what I'm what I hope to be able to convince you of is that it doesn't impede research at all, rather that it gives you some benefit that you may not have, have thought was out there. So with regard to GDPR, this is, I think it's my two slide primer on GDPR, and that's about all you need. 
because uh, most individuals don't want to read through the pages and pages of this stuff. The, I think the question is that has to be answered is, can you do open-ended research that's compatible with the principles of opt-in versus opt-out? That is, you, you have to give your permission. You can't assume permission. Um, and with the concept of data minimization, only collect the data that you need to, to answer your question. Don't go broad and collect everything in hopes that you have a data set that can answer all questions. You would almost say that, you know, these are kind of at odds with the way we've always thought about, uh, about open-ended research. Um, well, I, those are questions that I think can be addressed, but the, the, the basic issue is that the systems that exist today just are not in a state that they could be retrofit that this, you know, it really comes down to the model of control that you either have institutional control or you have individual control and trying to find necessary systems to make that possible, I think, are the challenge. I had the advantage of, I've had the advantage of working with, a, this is a company in uh, Finland that does a lot of GDPR work in the medical and health research space Privian. Um, and on one of their seminars, they had this one slide summary of GDPR, which I thought was awesome. And they gave me permission to use it verbatim. So I have, there's no modification on this slide other than my little thank you uh, on the slide. You can see that the, the, pr the principles of GDPR are principles of transparency, of being purposeful, uh, of how the data is being used, minimizing the data that's collecting, having data be accurate, having limitations on how long that data is, is stored, et cetera, et cetera. And these are reflected in the rights of individuals, rights to be informed, right to access, right to correct, right to erase. You should be able to erase your data, um, right to restrict how your data is being used right to portability, right to object to something. Um, and so it's really these kinds of rights that if you if you think about it from an institutional model, they're not always there, right? If in institutional control, um, it's hard to go to Facebook and say, could you please delete my data? Not only what's there today, but what you have in all your backups, what you have in, you know, derived databases that you have, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. And so understanding how these rights are going to be implemented is the essence of GDPR. So hopefully this one slide is a kind of a nice thing to keep in mind. So let me just throw out a really crazy thought. What if we were to abandon institutional control models? I mean, and it, it's it's crazy. They can't throw tomatoes at me, Sharon, because um, I'm in a protected space or I'm in a safe space, I should say. But um, what if we threw away the way the world works today? And you know, would would there be a benefit? Well, for rare disease research, it, it would it could be um, tremendously enabling, right? It 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 could get rid of some of the slowness, some of the inability to. Um, gather the necessary cohorts of patients that you need to engage in studies. And it would provide a direct mechanism for engagement with the people that you recruit. So I'd say that's, that's a plus. Um, another one is, you know, a lot of people don't participate because they know the history of how, how health data has been misused. So it, it directly addresses those that haven't been studied because they won't participate. And it addresses their concerns because they are the ones that have control over their data. So the data misuse issue goes by the wayside because they're the ones that are controlling how their data is going to be used. Now you could say that that's a bit too extreme. Maybe there's a way that you can, you can combine this and I say examples of that are some of the pharma companies and uh, one of the health systems, this, uh, this one in Vermont, have kind of embraced both. So they, they do give back 
the data to the individuals. They do it in a, in a fashion where they, they decide, the, the patient decides how they're going to participate in health research and the institution still um, has a copy of their data as provider networks do or as, as the uh, pharma companies typically do. So they're, they're trying to find a way of segueing from the old world to the new world. And th this is something that, that uh, several companies that we've worked with are doing. But I, I'll, to be quite frank, I say the last one is one that comes up uh, much more often, and that is where you have a, a PI or, or any institution that has historically had absolute control over the data doesn't want to give it up. And the, the one most recently for me, I was working with a local high school district uh, to try to address some of the mental health challenges that existed through COVID. And I had been working with Rady Children's Hospital, who has some wonderful uh, capabilities to address the mental health needs of adolescents and with the school system and with their counselors. And what it came down to at the end of the day was that the counselors didn't want to give up control. So they didn't want the data to be um, shared and under the control of individuals. They wanted to be the stewards of that data. And so it's, it was just kind of yet another anecdotal example of where this institutional control model is very ingrained. And it's, it's, it's all about, you know, this is the way I've always worked. I need to keep working this way. So I think what I what I am hoping to do is to give you a sense that um, there is an alternative, and I would say you, you could also be more subtle and say, is it different in discovery research and clinical research? And to my mind, it's not really. It's just you know yet another facet that that one has to consider. So to give you a sense of where a solution might lie, there's there's been for quite a while, a focus on trying to design systems from the ground up that focus on privacy as the and, and how privacy is provided and how control of privacy is, is offered um, called privacy by design. So in other words, build a system that from the start uses privacy and implements privacy in this new model. Um, you know, I'm always reminded that these sort of really crazy disruptions are things that often happen. And they're, the, they're along these vectors that people are just ignoring, right? I've, I always use institutional control, why change it? Um, I believe that securing data privacy for the individual is one of these vectors. So I, my prediction, the only one, is that uh, implementing privacy like exists with GDPR is something that's going to become uh, in the future the way that the world works. It just happens to take to get there and, and who's gonna help enable that. Um, like I said, it, it is very much, it is the law of the land in the European Union and in some states, it's gonna be the law of the land uh, shortly. And again, my, my fear is that the way that state legislation goes and it's going to get out ahead of federal legislation and we're just going, we as health researchers are going to be really hard pressed to do the right thing for each citizen of each state. So let's take a high road and, and uh, do it kind of once and, and for all. And so I'd also say that, you know, offering transparency and control ultimately shifts the balance of power to the individual and really um, reinforces the importance of trust of the individual because they, they have that control. And that's exactly what I believe is needed to really address the diversity and inclusion issue. It's, it's getting people that are engaged and that, are, that have the trust and confidence that when they give their data, it's gonna be used for the purpose that they intended, which is to advance health research, to find uh, health solutions and the like. So I think that People haven't thought about privacy simply because they think it's all about consumer data. I think it's very much about uh, health and health data um, going down the road. And as so Sharon said, I, I work with Luna and I 
not too surprising when I focus on information and privacy uh, with my colleagues. And the, the model that we have is really to implement the, a system which, is, which implements GDPR, so which puts the control of information and how it's being used with individuals. And what we basically try to do is to make data that are, that are being shared by patients and their disease or research communities, we make it uh, available in a form that is research ready. So we are allowing the individuals to have their data speak the language of the researcher. And on the industrial side or the, the academic researcher side, we provide the tools that allow them to work in pretty much in the way that they're used to working, do the analyses that they're used to doing, but to work with that data and to take advantage of the fact that it can be longitudinal data that's constantly being updated, that has a very rich set of, I'd say, traditional phenotype, genotype information and patient reported outcomes, you know, and, and, and. So it's amazing that when you engage directly with people, the kind of information that they will share, and I use the word share, not give, um, it, it can be quite broad. And it opens up, I think, research opportunities that just don't exist today. So we see this as, as uh, something that, that's really exciting. We have some, um, some experience with communities, uh, one, during during done during covid where we can take advantage of the fact that the platform is digital it comes into your home you can you can contribute uh data and information uh in a very safe and secure manner we did did this uh a study with the vermont uh university of vermont health network this was really to to ask people to participate in letting the health network understand the quality of care that they give and if there was anything they could they could uh, tune to improve quality based upon the information that individuals were sharing um again another another uh COVID study this one in canada and my intent was not to talk about all of them but really to focus on one great example uh this was with kcnt a rare genetic epilepsy we did it in uh, in conjunction with Biogen, and so this was forming a community that that hadn't really been formed, and and seeing whether or not it could be prepared in a manner that that could be used directly by Biogen to do research. They have an interest in trying to uh, find a cure, find um, useful medicines in, in this particular area for a disease, which is really I think terrible for the families and obviously for the for the children. What we found was that when you, when you do things differently, so when you basically tell people your data is your data, you control it, you're going to, you can provide access to the data to a, a research organization. And the goal of providing that access is to try to um, find solutions, find improvements uh, for the affected in, individuals. What we, we found was that, you know, all of a sudden, some things that are historically really hard, I won't say they were easy, but they were straightforward. So international recruitment, which is often a challenge, especially with what's going on in privacy laws, was straightforward. Um, doing it in a way where you could share insights and give those insights also to the pharma partner gave them a better better sense of what the endpoints were that they should be following I, you know pharma has a sense of if i could do this this will be great for patients but when you actually interact with the patients and they can give you a sense of the lived experience that they have sometimes those endpoints change so i see, see that as a great benefit to the patient community but it's also uh, the, the appropriate focus for the pharma partner, in this case, Biogen. From a recruitment standpoint, I believe they wanted to get 20, 20 or 25 patients over the course of a year. Uh, we, I'd say we clearly exceeded that uh, by getting 71 patients that were fully enrolled. Um, we could, were able to collaborate with uh, the top pediatric neurologists who had, 
who had started to do work and that had a cohort. So kind of there was that kind of collaboration with the research environment. And the, I think the amazing thing, people don't talk about time, but uh, I believe that we exceeded the target even after two weeks. So we had our first touch point is that we were two times over, you know, twice as many people and we could do it in two weeks. So this whole notion that organizing a group, organizing a cohort for research doesn't have to take years. That when you use this new way of approaching people, that they have power, things are different in a, in a positive way. Um, just a couple of other kind of touch points around with this environment where individuals are in control of their data, the, the kind of engagement that you get is, I think it's remarkable, it's heartening, and it gives you, I think it gives you some, uh, a positiveness about where this can go as you adopt the model of having individuals control their data through data privacy. Whether it was the, the COVID study where, you know, to say that 54% of the people that had joined completed all data requests. Like I said, I, I, I'm not, um, I don't swim in the, in the registry pool on a regular basis, but it just seems like this is the kind of engagement you would hope, but it's nice that you see this uh, happening today in the case PXE, which is Sharon's uh, work. I think it was one email and it was a tripling of this of the people that are participating. Wonderful, right? That that's the kind of outreach that you'd like. In the case of KCNT, here's the numbers. Um, again, the number of individuals that you got that we were able to recruit were significantly more. So the the studies that they're able to do would be significantly improved in terms of their power. And the amount of data that was collected was double of what they thought, what Biogen had thought they were going to be able to use. So these are all, I'd say, positives. So my answer to the question is, it seems like it might be quite the enabler rather than the impediment that um, you might have thought about. So in summary, and with the goal of not wanting to drone on and on and, and maybe take some Q&A, um, in summary, the three points that I wanted to leave you with are these. So I believe, and I think there's plenty of evidence, and I've tried to provide uh, the evidence that there is, and it's truly a tectonic shift in including data privacy, involving data privacy, and how it, it has to be handled. And just because we live in the, many of us, I saw some, one person at least was from the UK, just because many of us do research in the US, that's not a get out of jail card. You know, what's happening in California and Virginia and Colorado, and, and there are many other states that are pretty far along as well, suggests that we, we need to start thinking about how we can do things differently. The second is, this is not just a hopeless, it, it's not a, oh, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? There, there is a solution that's been demonstrated. And this is, I'd say this is very broad. This is not about any one platform, any one solution. It's a general solution that if you focus on privacy as systems are built up, if you, if you make that the focus, there is a path to having fully functional health research um, that is not at all impeded, but possibly is enabled by doing data privacy properly. And the third is that, and this is, maybe this is my belief, but I think it, it shared is that, I believe that as you move to these modern data privacy models that are pr pretty much built around things like GDPR and, and related, that it provides the path to inclusiveness and engagement and global reach that e each of those actually are, are viewed as challenges with the way the world works today. So we have enough evidence that it is working that way, you know, transferring data from the EU to the US to Japan, that all works as long as it's fully consented and you're complying with 
with a very you know high standard of data privacy uh, regulation. So amazingly, it's not the big impediment that people have thought, but it can actually be a solution to the problem that that um, people have been mulling over and they just didn't realize that privacy was the solution. It wasn't the problem. So that's all that I wanted to say. Um, thank you and uh, thank you all for for listening and I am very happy to take questions and Sharon, I don't know if you want to want to organize or yep. um, I'm not very yeah. good with I'm not very good with cats as many people know <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you can if you can help organize the questions I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yes, fabulous. Thanks, Scott. And maybe take your slides down because we'll uh, we'll look at each other, which would be great. Um, super. So thank you, uh, Scott, for such a great overview. Um, I'll just preface uh, putting out giving you some of the questions by saying that uh, I think Scott made the point, but I want to make it uh, very, very clear that what we're looking at is a mishmash of both federal and state regulations. Um, multi -con countries, international, and most of us running registries, running even just our organizations in terms of membership, et cetera, are touching most of those jurisdictions, many of those jurisdictions, and they are not harmonized. And so the way that Luna has tackled this and why we've chosen to make Luna our technology solution provider is that they have chosen to go always with the highest bar, not the lowest bar, and to make sure they're compliant with everything. So that said, um, Scott, I think one area, there's a couple questions about EHR. So what does Luna connect to? How does Luna overcome that hurdle, which is a separate technology problem from the privacy issues, um, but, uh, but the point uh, uh, being, and, and is Luna itself GDPR compliant is the questions, or the yeah, so, set of questions around that. <clears throat> so Lu Luna is GDPR compliant, and what that means is that as we have data from European citizens that you need to go through, there's a, there's a process called a DPIA or data protection impact assessment that you do to understand each of the types of data that are being collected, how it's being used, how it's being shared, and whether you are doing the right thing with each set of data. So we will do a DPIA when we have a, the amount of data from those sorts of individuals that, that require it. So when I say that we comply, we comply because all of the, all of the requirements we abide by, but they're, even though you abide by them, there's still this other step to make sure that you really go through and look at on a case by case basis, the type of data that's being collected and that you're doing the right thing to protect that type of data. So that's, it's, it's a yes with qualification. Um, the other questions, this is still early on a, on a week for me. So what were the other two parts of that question, Sharon? Uh, so, so basically, I think you've answered it essentially how the, the Luna with it bringing in EHR, genomic data, PRO, all that, um, how that, how that works. So on the, on the technology side, the, I mean, the nice thing, I, and I say this is particularly true in the U.S. that, you know, health records have, have moved uh, almost entirely to, to being digital, obviously the notes in health records are slowly becoming um, made available through the open notes work. Uh, so we we connect with the the portals, the patient portals. Patients basically provide their credentials. Uh, they maintain control of those credentials. They allow us to open up a connection on their behalf, and so that they're health record data can flow into Luna on a regular basis. I believe it's weekly we, we uh, refresh. And if they ever want to break the connection, they simply remove their credentials. If they want to delete their data, they simply delete their data. So it, and it, it all goes away. So we our policies are such that um, from a technology perspective, anything that's digital uh, is imminently connectable. So, and, and much of the data, you can think of wearables, you can think of EHR data, uh, genomic data, grew up in the digital world, so it's all digital. So these are things that are, 
rather straightforwardly brought in, and uh, in many cases, they're well-developed. The survey data, we have a library of validated instruments. We you know, provide for bespoke instruments, uh, and so that's kind of where things are. But all of that is, again, I stress, these are this is information being shared by people. We don't own it. We don't control it. Uh, it's it's owned, if you will, and controlled by the individuals, and it's only through their through their goodwill that they're sharing the data to help advance some aspect of medical research. Great, thanks, Scott. Uh, a question we've gotten a fair amount, and we have in a, a form here as well, and maybe we'll take this in two parts. The first part being, okay, so how does a small advocacy group become? GDPR and all of these other privacy regulation compliant such that they we can operate in every state and every country the way we have been. Yeah, I think the well, I, I think the answer to that is to find find a data platform that implements uh, that implements a modern data privacy model. So and GDPR is GDPR is overarching to all of the current state uh, regulations that have been passed or are being considered. Um, it also works well with Pepita in Canada and with, uh, it's pretty much all of the, all of the models are based on the principles that were in GDPR in that one slide. So the solution is find a platform that implements that uh, and take advantage of the fact that that platform exists and that it really comes down to you know what's the focus of the registry, what's the research you want to try to tackle, and it, and that's the solution. Uh, Luna is obviously one of those platforms. I fully believe that over the course of time, other platforms are going to evolve. That's not a bad thing, right? You want to have many people looking at ways to to advance health research and to do it with data privacy handled in in an appropriate way. Great. Okay, I'll open the floor for questions. Unless we tackled them all. And Sharon, as I said, I, I will I'll send to you um, the PDF. So if if you or if the people that are on or that listen to the recording want to look into some of the some of the supporting material, it's some of the reading. Well, I find it interesting. <laughs> I think my wife always comments that I'm a bit of a nerd, but uh, there's some really, there's some really thoughtful work that's been done in the area. And uh, just kind of reading through the way people have thought about it is really, it's enriching. So I'd encourage you if you have an interest to, you know, follow some of those links and, and um, consider the, what's been published. Um, yeah, and I and I think um, for uh, sorry, John. Just I'll just make one comment. I think for, to the question of how do we become GDPR compliant, I think it is the solution is not going to be in house for us. Not even for Genetic Alliance. Certainly, you know, many of you know I run PXE International, which is a small advocacy group, and I update the slide that uh, Scott showed and say we have now nearly a thousand people who have joined um, the registry, which is just phenomenal uh, for us. Um, but I, but there's no way that PXE International could ever figure out how to be GDPR, CCPA, Colorado, Virginia, Brazil, all that compliant. Um, we could hire lawyers, but I don't want to spend all of our money on that. For me, this is back to the days when we all were trying to code a cart to put on our website in HTML. Some of you are not old enough to remember that we needed to do that when we started. And now we just put PayPal or Venmo or Zelle or Wise or whatever we want on there because there's solutions. And so Luna is providing a service, a technology that allows us to do that. And as Scott said, certainly other, other platforms will come along that can do that as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and then I should say, and Genetic Alliance is much bigger than PXE and decided the same thing that, you know, we cannot turn our resources toward this and are really happy to have been partnering with, with Luna, as Scott said, actually for years, even prior to the founding of Luna, uh, Dawn Berry's also on. We've been working together for decades around trying to get this solved and we believe we have and we were actually ahead of GDPR regulations coming out and all these other ones. So 
So we're really excited that there is a solution and we don't have to build it. John, I, I think I interrupted you. No problem. Thank you. And thank you for adding those details. Um, I think I just wanted to follow up with two things. Just one, I think, um, I know for me and for conversations I've had within our organization and with our community members, with researchers, um, with with physicians, that this seems like a really, really valuable tool. Um, and so we actually, I've been talking with people about trying to, well, I've, for a couple of years, been working with a couple of people to try to do something like this. So this is really exciting. And uh, it seems frankly impossible. So that I agree that certainly <laughs> This is, uh, you know, we're just not well positioned in the network of the knowledge network, if you will, uh, to put all the pieces together, even if even if we have a good idea that fulfills a need. Um, so this is really exciting. I'll definitely be bringing that this up with those individuals. Um, so I just kind of wanted to comment on that uh, and, and see how impact to toss out there. I think this could be really impactful for us. And then. Um, then GDPR, this is more for um, maybe uh, Sharon and, and Catherine and Genetic Alliance in general. Uh, I was wondering, um, and maybe in the boot camp going forward, I don't know. I don't know how this would play out, but uh, I know we have questions as an organization as well on membership, just like you mentioned. And so that, it seems like a separate issue than this much more ultimately sophisticated platform for reaching across our very fractured healthcare system, which is very much a need. And also, we just have plain like, hmm, is Mailchimp GDPR compliant kind of quite things that you know. Um, so that maybe I'll, maybe the appropriate place might be to follow up with an email. I guess I kind of wanted to mention that that we see that as a need as well. In addition to it, this really important research, need. right? Yeah, yeah, John, great point. And I think I think right now these are probably two slightly separate issues, although they're the same issue. And I think the other thing that we've been working hard with Luna on is in another iterative cycle. You know, if, for those of you who, who who know about what we've been doing, we've been again working with Luna for a very long time. And Luna has been absolutely fabulous in that they've embraced the advocacy community as the drivers of what's happening in terms of the various features and um, the 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 technology that they're creating. And so as we bring them these problems, um, they've been really responsive to, to solving them. And lots of times genetic clients is collaborating with them in, the, in this. Um, we, have, we have had lots of discussions, Dawn and Scott and others at, at uh, Luna uh, with us about, okay, it's fabulous. Our registry and all of our studies now are all compliant. You know, genetic alliance has its own IRB. Luna is taking care of all the spells and whistles for us here and bread and butter as well. What about our membership list? What about the conversations between our members on Google Groups or Facebook or using MailChimp or using Constant Contact? So this is not not on their radar and is something that with them we are trying to figure out, you know, do we start to embrace some forms of communication between advocacy groups and advocacy group members within Luna's platform? Do we figure out ways that we actually run a lot of our membership and, you know, Rolodex essentially kinds of um, uh, tech, uh, pieces through Luna? Um, so I'll, I'll stop talking and have uh, either Scott or Dawn or, or both say something about that because they're, they're wonderfully aware of our needs and paying lots of attention to what we need beyond just the formal registry piece. So Dawn, do you want to do you want to um, unmute yourself and handle that one? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's worth a longer term discussion in terms of ongoing communications, daily communications, insights delivery, et cetera. So, so not to punt on it, but I, I think it's worth a, a discussion on what are the communication aims, what's on our roadmap, what should be on our roadmap if it isn't. So, that's an open invitation to talk about that more further. <sighs> Great. Um, and John, I see your comment in the in the comments too. And so the tomatoes were thrown at me in 1995 because I said we want our own separate cloister community that we the patients completely control. Scott's comment about cats is great because my TED talk, I say, I actually learned to herd the cats if you move the food. And so for me, the food was data, was biological samples, and Genetic Alliance runs its own biobank as a result as well. And so the beauty of this for me is that, yes, we each have our own cloistered community because, man, do my PXE people love that PXE International is running this and they can see me and they can touch me and they can feel me and, and everything while they're in this Luna system because it's branded 
PXE International and so forth. And then at the same time, I get the underlying technology that I could never afford or, or even dream of what I need to do about and, and can just say, you take care of that because I want to take care of, you know, the next uh, assay development and biomarker study, not this other stuff. So I think this is the, the sweet thing about this is it's both that we get to be our own trusted communities. And Luna very much believes in that. It's part of their philosophy that they're not the experts on the communities. And Genetic Alliance, we say, we're not the experts on your communities. You're the experts. And so any way we can enable that is important to us. And then at the same time, again, let's build on t common technologies, common in that they're standardized, they're useful across the uh, world, across the globe. So we will put on our uh, roadmaps, both Luna and Genetic Alliance, as well as um, working with all of you, how to um, how to make sure that the other things we're doing are compliant. Um, you, you probably know that uh, those of you who are uh, tuned into Community Forum, which is Genetic Alliance's Google group, that we've been convening a series of discussions amongst advocacy organizations. And this certainly could be a great topic for the next one. I have a question if there's a moment for one. <laughs> sure. Uh, this is Megan Patterson with Ask the Cures. We are such huge fans of <clears throat> the mission and the work and the people behind this um, and really looking forward to getting involved um, in some way in the future. I would love to, you know, thinking about diversity and inclusion, I think this kind of platform to enable research um, kind of in and of itself uh, you know, lends itself to kind of a specific phenotype of patient that may not that may not necessarily promote inclusion of all patient populations. You know, we work with with older patients, for example, and um, so I, I would just love to hear how you think about that and the tension there and and the way that you you kind of bring balance um, if in fact you've even seen that. So, yeah. So when you say an older an older community, there you're your question is really about um, kind of comfort with technology, comfort with the yeah, comfort with and I think access to technology also is a huge piece of this, right? For lower income populations, mm -hmm. um, you know. And so when we think about putting together a representative perspective, um, you know, there's kind of some more strategy required if you're if you're using a platform like this. So I just love to know how you um, help people work through that, or if you've seen this come up. Right, so on, on the technology side, so there's a lot of effort that we've put into making sure the, the technology is available on, I'd say very low end uh, information with, with very modest bandwidth requirements. So it's not like a video streaming um, requirement that you have. And so if, if you look at the, the number of smartphones and the populations that have smartphones or that have a computer, you know, and that are connected to internet in some way it's actually a pretty large group and there there are exclusions but a lot of those exclusions are addressed you know they they use a computer at a church or you know, you know other other places that they that they gather that can get access to technology so it, i guess my comment is it is something that we've tried to think about from the start um these are always a journey and I, it's the same journey that when school went online for everyone that I was, I was also the president of our school board and, you know, how to make sure that every single student had access to a digital environment that they could do the work was front and center. So uh, I'm not going to suggest it's perfect, but I do think that our direction has always been to make sure that we enable for everybody. And we try to do that in a very equitable fashion by focusing on those solutions that exist, not by requiring them to raise some bar on, you know, on their behalf. And, and Megan, I'll add that um, for the people side of this, because that's kind of uh, simply put how uh, Luna and we um, are, uh, are working together is Luna's doing a lot of the technology solution. We're doing a lot of the people solution. And then of course we collaborate on all of it. Um, Genetic Alliance has 36 years of history in reaching underserved communities. Certainly 36 years ago, that meant rare diseases because those were underserved. But in our work in the last 
20 years or so, Scott referenced the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which was a very um, broad coalition that we built. Um, we have 10,000 organizations under our umbrella. Uh, some of those are the traditional advocacy organizations, both common and rare, but a lot of them are communities that you'd be surprised at. Uh, you know, different parts of the elephant know each other. And so a lot of our work has been, how do we be with people where they er eat, work, play, pray, how do we um, come to them where they are? My organization is all adult onset, mostly low vision. Um, you, you and I have had some conversations about it because it includes right. intermittent claudication. Uh, and the, a thousand have signed up of the roughly 3000 that we know of in the world. We have a whole host of things we do in order to enable people to interact with these systems. Um, in some cases, it's as simple as telephone calls and being the proxy for someone uh, as they enter the system like this. In other cases, it's working with their younger relatives. In other cases, we deployed um, tablets to a clinic of uh, individuals affected by sickle cell anemia and, and sickle cell trait in Alabama and had people in the clinic for weeks just enrolling people on tablets. Um, we've done uh, outreach with the Ohio faith community, which is almost all elderly people who believe that their faith community should be where they learn about health. And so we have years and years and years and lots and lots of tools um, in which we've used uh, all kinds of, of uses. And, and in fact, we also engage 270 Strategies, which was Barack Obama's um, firm that reached out to the nation to get him elected twice. Uh, and they've given us a whole host of uh, advice on these issues as well. So lots here. Um, there's another part of this whole thing called the promise for engaging everyone responsibly. And that's what Genetic Alliance focuses on is our program. Catherine Lambertson, who's on as the director of that program, uh, she takes care of that sort of stuff while Luna takes care beautifully of the technology. And as I said, we constantly work together to improve that interface between us. Yeah, that's exciting. Thank you so much. So Be Betty asked a question about genetic, uh, about genetic data on public computers. So I'd say that m m the place where people are going to get their genetic data are either a uh, a ancestry type company, so 23andMe, Ancestry, and there are obviously many, several others, um, or it would be in their EHR, say if they got a, a very specific, maybe they got a bracket test or something like that. So in both of those cases, the data does live on a computer. When they, if you're, you're asking, if they go to a public community, uh, public computer, say their church, um, and they they input that data. So in the case of the EHR, the data it basically the data never touches the the client computer, so it's it's never there. In the case of things like Ancestry and Twenty uh, Three and Me, um, they they basically we provide a, a recipe on how they can download it and upload it, and we would make it. We used to make it completely invisible. That is where we could get the data from 23andMe, but 23andMe decided they didn't like to enable that for their users. So uh, they now have to go through a bit of a recipe. And part of that recipe is to remind people to uh, clean up after themselves. So it's, you know, at the end of the day, we, we're just trying to be responsible and, you know, we're, we don't believe in replicating data. We actually like to have a single copy that's being shared and that's how they can exert control over it. Um, so that's the way I would address your question, which is a, a really important one. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. Thank you everybody for participating. As we've said, this is recorded. We will be um, we will be able to um, give you access to the recording. And as Scott uh, has generously offered, he will also be giving us a PDF with the links hot in it so that we can give you that as well. And you can click on those additional items to read. Thank you for organizing and everyone. Thank you for an hour of your day today. It was a pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Okay.